Okay. Well, I should thank you. The next presentation will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel for later viewing. Go ahead, Nick. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you. It's been a long time since I've spoken to Arvan. I used to be much more active than I am now. Um, second of all, I would like to apologize for not being there in person. The plan was for me to be there in person, but uh, just a couple, a few weeks ago, I, I, I uh, was tasked to do some CDC work in New Jersey. So I'm, I'm actually calling in from New Jersey. Uh, okay, so I'm talking to you tonight about fall migration birding because it's fall migration time and, and we love birding. I love birding. So it's one of my favorite topics actually. Okay, next slide, John. Okay, we all know that birds are seasonal and many species are migratory with a well-defined breeding season and wintering season. In the Northern hemisphere, these migratory birds generally migrate north during spring migration and south during fall migration. That may sound obvious, but not all birds do that. And for example, the California gull migrates west and east. <clears throat> Birders, it turns out, are also seasonal. <clears throat> they practice their recreational birding activities with seasonality as well. And you could even argue that they are migratory as well. For example, birders flock to Nome, Alaska in June, but are practically absent there during, during other months. Birding is super popular in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas in the winter months, but is practically non-existent during the extreme heat of summer. Here in Fort Collins, it turns out that birders are most active during April and May, when land birds are returning north during spring migration. I am an active birder all year long, and I've noticed that I meet other folks out birding, mostly in springtime. To verify this, this observation, I turned to eBird.org. For those of you who don't know much about eBird, it is a global repository of birding checklist data that can be used to better understand avian distribution and population trends. And therefore it is also useful for conservation. Here I use last year's eBird data for Larimer County to compare birder effort to species diversity across the 12 months of the year. Species diversity is represented by the blue bars, which is the number of species reported to eBird during each of the months. And birder activity is represented by the red line, which tracks the number of checklists submitted to eBird. So <clears throat> for species diversity, the maximum is in May with over 250 species. And then the next highest is in September with about 250 species exactly. That makes sense. That's during the peaks of spring and fall migration. Uh, there are two peaks of birder activity, the red line, a big peak during spring migration and a small peak at Christmas time. So you see the red line goes up between November and December. Uh, the Christmas peak represents wide, per, widespread participation in the Christmas bird counts. Note that birder activity is low during fall migration. Next, please. So why are birders less active in the fall compared to the spring? I don't think there's a simple answer to this question. More likely there are multiple factors at play. One of these is that birds are less obvious in the fall. Even though the bird population has doubled due to recent breeding activity, the inflated number of birds transit our area over a longer period of time in the fall. So the rate of migration, uh, in other words, the number of birds coming through our area is probably about the same during spring and fall on any one day. Um, 
In general, I would say migration of birds during fall is less obvious than during spring. So birders have to work harder in the fall. Um, consider, for example, I'm not sure if I explained that so well. It's less obvious because uh, there's more there's there's more leaves on the trees, for example, and the birds are not as uh, boisterous, not as loud. They, they don't sing, and they're in, in duller plumage. So that's those are three reasons why the birds are less obvious. Uh, consider, for example, the two photos on this slide. One was taken during the breeding season, and one was taken during fall migration. Uh, the, the one on top is the breeding season, the one, one below is fall migration. They're both the same species, but the spring version is relatively easy to find. It sings frequently during the breeding season, and thus is easier to locate by sound in the spring and summer. It will also sit out in the open sometimes when singing, whereas the fall migrants are stealthy, silent, and many are dull plumaged. Do you recognize the bird in the top photo? That's right. It is an adult McGillivray's warbler. Now, how about the bird in the bottom photo? This migrant juvenile McGillivray's warbler was photographed in early September 2020 at Timnath Reservoir, which is one of my favorite birding destinations in the fall. So the point of this slide is to just point out that uh, the bird on the top is a lot easier to observe than the bird on the bottom. Okay, I mentioned eBird earlier. Here's another data download from eBird.org. And this is a bar chart data. And it's pretty, fairly simple to, to uh, request that eBird display the, the, either the bar chart for all the species or just for up to five species. And you can even select the time period, the, the number of years to include data from, et cetera. So this is uh, data for all of Larimer County and it's from the last 10 or 11 years. So the, the green uh, bars indicate uh, not only which months were the birds present, but how relatively abundant they were. So the very thin green line is rare and the very thickest green line is common. So I enter all my bird sightings into eBird.org. And I also use eBird's data uh, for various purposes, like this one tonight. Um, I hope this talk will help you appreciate the value of data in eBird I will encourage you to submit all of your sightings there as well. Now here I show four bar chart data of four species of birds um, observed among eBird checklists during the last decade. These charts demonstrate that the number of birds that migrate through Larimer County during fall is larger than during spring. And that the passage of these birds is more protracted in, in the fall. This is especially true for shorebirds. And so for example, uh, the least sandpiper, which is the first one on the list, is fairly common during six weeks of spring migration. And, uh, but, but it's fairly common during 15 weeks of fall migration. An example among songbirds is the orange crowned warbler, which is the last one on this list. Uh, <coughs> This bird is frequently observed during spring for five weeks, uh, but during fall, it's frequently observed for 10 weeks. Okay, next, please. Okay, here's another type of data that I, I downloaded from eBird from the bar chart uh, data. You can also look at it as a, as a line graph. Uh, so here's another view of the data. This view, we can also better appreciate the timing of migration of the orange crowned warbler. Spring migration spans from April 15th to June 15th. While we can determine that fall migration through Larimer County begins as early as July 15th and finalizes during the first week of November. 
I'm guessing few of you have thought, would have thought that fall migration starts so early for the species. That may be in part because birders are less active in the fall, so we are not quite as aware of fall birding trends. Have any of you ever seen a migrating orange crowned warbler in July? You don't have to answer that question, just think about it. <laughs> I don't think I ever have, but, but the data show here that the frequency does start to increase in the fall as early as July 15th. If you have seen one that you believe was a migrant during July or August, early August, go ahead and, and uh, tell us where and when in the chat, if you don't mind. <clears throat> okay, next please. Okay, so here's another shorebird, the Baird Sandpiper, for which the eBird data clearly shows more birds migrating through Larimer County in the fall compared to the spring. So here it's not just a question of more time that it's common, uh, commonly seen, but also more birds. And anybody who's been out to uh, a shoreline in a big reservoir can tell you that there's many more Baird Sandpipers seen in fall than, than you would ever see in the spring. Um, not only is fall, uh, okay. Here again, fall migration begins early in the summer in early July and is mostly done by the first week of November. Most of the fall migrants are juveniles, which are told from adults by their buffy wash to the head and breast. And in the photo, the juveniles in the top photo, the adults is in the bottom photo. And notice that the juvenile is a little bit more buffy or yellowish around the breast and head than the adult is. Now, my friend, uh, Walter Wetchy, told me that the name for Baird Sandpiper in Swedish is actually Yellow-Breasted Sandpiper. It all makes sense now. Note also that the long wings that extend beyond, note also the long wings that extend beyond the tail in the, in the, uh, Baird, in the Baird Sandpiper. Uh, this is a feature that separates them from other peeps, uh, other small sandpipers or peeps like least sandpiper, semi-palmated sandpiper, and western sandpiper. Long wings often indicate long distance migrants. And indeed, the Baird sandpiper that passes through Colorado during fall migration is on a stopover between the Arctic tundra breeding grounds and its wintering grounds in the southern cone of South America. Next, please. Okay. So this presentation reviews several species of birds that are primarily found in Northern Colorado during fall migration. How to identify them and where to find them. Timnath Reservoir is a, is a great example of a, a birding location in, uh, that, that's very productive in, in, for fall migration. And it's my favorite birding hotspot during fall migration. This is a view of Timnath Reservoir from the Northeast side. Okay, so the first birds I'm going to discuss uh, are scoters. And scoters are generally found in large reservoirs and also smaller ponds like gravel pit ponds where, um, where crawdads and fish are abundant. That's what they like to eat. Scoters are a class of diving duck that breed on remote ponds in the boreal forests of Alaska and Canada and winter at sea along both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. There are three species that migrate through Colorado where they are never common and are highly prized by birders. As you can see from this bar chart created from eBird data from the last decade, the three scoter species primarily occur during late fall in October and November. Another similar diving duck is the long-tailed duck uh, which is listed fourth in this list, formerly called Old Squaw. But as you can see, this species actually winters in Colorado in small numbers and also occurs during spring migration. So all four of these species feed on fish and crawdads and are found on lakes of all sizes. Timnath Reservoir is an excellent location to find scoters. Next, please. Scoters are fairly straightforward for identification, except when they are distant, 
sleeping and in juvenile plumage, which is almost always in Colorado. Surf scoter juveniles have a flatter head than the other species and often appear to be wearing a black cap. So the surf scoters are pictured in the top left. Black scoter juveniles are in the middle picture. They look like adult female black scoters with a large pale patch on the side of their head, the sort of the lower face uh, that is um, much larger than the smaller patches found on other scoters, like the surf scoters, you can see the two small patches on the head and the white wing scoter in the bottom right has two small patches on the head as well. This patch is one large patch. You turn 19 years of age. Uh, the bills and heads of, of the um, <laughs> black scoters black. are the smallest of all the scoters, appearing more like a typical dabbling duck, such as gadwall or female redhead, which is, which is also a diving duck and much more common in Colorado. John, I think we muted um, Nick. Okay, I'm, I'm back on, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, I'm talking about black scoter identification. I'm pointing out that um, they can look like uh, male ruddy ducks that are not in breeding plumage because they also have a big white cheek. But ruddy ducks are a little bit smaller than black scoters. <clears throat> okay, juvenile white wing scoter, such as this one in the bottom right here. Uh, this was this was a uh, present last year in, in in at for several weeks or maybe even over a month at Ziegler Pond. So uh, a lot of people got to see it. Uh, it was a rare case of when a white wing scoter is actually close to. You could actually approach quite close to to a white wing scoter. Um, the juvenile white wing scoter falls in between the other two scoter species in terms of head shape and bill size. They are unique in showing a bright white wing patch when they spread their wings. Next, please. Okay, so here's our first pop quiz. What species of scoter are these? <clears throat> and here's sort of a typical scenario where you see scoters many of which are sleeping very distantly in the middle of a reservoir and it's bad light and you just can't get a very good look. Even at the telescope, it's hard to get a good look. So, okay, here, so here's your first quiz. Um, this is photographed in my favorite local birding spot for fall migrants, Timnith Reservoir. It's mid-November, November 10th. Uh, what, and... Um, what species are these? Here's your choices. A, surf scoters, B, black scoters, C, white wing scoters, or D, all of the above. All right, think about that for a moment. You got your answer ready? All right, next slide, please. C is the correct answer, white wing scoters. So now the... Um, up, so uh, when scoters are, are close to you, they're often easily differentiated, but when they're far away, they can be difficult, like the ones in this photo. This group is a mix of adults and immatures. One of them has its wings spread and showing the white inner flight feathers that form the white wing patch. The second bird from the left, if you look carefully, has a white wing patch. You can't see the white in the wing in all the other birds. Um, but you can see that some of the adult males, like the third from the left, have a white comma, uh, white mark behind the eye in the shape of a comma. And note also that all of these birds are showing stiff tails, reminiscent of ruddy ducks, and scoters often show stiff, stiff tails. Next, please. Okay. Next, we have the loons. 
Four of the world's five species have occurred in Larimer County, almost always on large lakes. And I've listed a bunch of the lakes where I commonly see loons. Uh, they can occur on other lakes as well, but this, these are the, the typical places where people see lots of loons. Uh, this eBird bar chart indicates that yellow-billed and Pacific loon only occur in late fall. <clears throat> While red-throated and common loons occur primarily in the fall, but also in the spring. The loons have a migration pattern similar to the scoters, nesting in the far north and wintering at sea, with small numbers migrating over land. Next, please. Okay, so red-throated loon pictured in the upper left is the smallest of the loons. And this one was photographed at Chatfield Reservoir on November 8, 2020. This is a juvenile, uh, which has a, a pale gray neck and head. Um, the, these are often mixed with Western grebes, which they can resemble. They're about the same size as Western grebes, and the adults have sort of uh, white throats and darker heads, so almost like a white and black uh, uh, head like a Western grebe. But the neck is always thicker than a Western grebe's neck. Going uh, to the right, top right, Pacific loon is slightly larger than red-throated loon. Uh, and then going down from Pacific loon, common loon is even larger. And usually shows a bit of the adult's banded neck pattern. You can see this on this bird, a little bit of a white band there. Uh, and also the dark, below the white band, you can see a partial dark band on the neck. Um, <clears throat> Yellow-billed loon, which is bottom left, is, the, is even larger and usually shows a bit of the adult, I'm sorry, and has a massive pale bill and lighter basic plumage, which basic plumage refers to non-breeding plumage than common loon. So it's paler overall than common loon, especially on the neck and head. Uh, and you also notice the big bump on the forehead of the yellow-billed loon, that's typical head, head shape for a yellow-billed loon. Loon identification can be tricky, however, and I won't take the time to delve into the details tonight. That can be the topic of a future CFO birding skills workshop, I hope. Okay, next, please. All right, gulls. <clears throat> Several gull species are predominantly, predominantly or only seen during fall migration in Larimer County. Lamar County presents lots of good cuisine and lodging opportunities for gulls traveling through that may need a good meal or to take a rest from their travels. Gulls like to eat at garbage dumps, mud flats, recently plowed fields, and lakes with fish. We have plenty of these feeding opportunities here in the Front Range. Uh, huge flocks of gulls will rest together during the day on beaches and sandbars or open fields, all of which are plentiful in fall as the reservoir water levels are lowered. Of the five species of gulls included in this bar chart, only the Bonaparte skull occurs in good numbers during spring migration. However, uh, the numbers of Bonaparte skull is, are even greater in the fall. You can kind of see that the, uh, the bar and the bar chart is thicker in the fall section compared to the spring section. However, um, <clears throat> um, uh, in, in addition, the, uh, the fall migration period is longer than the spring migration period for Bonaparte skull. Okay, next please. Okay, so um, the other birds on the list include several, uh, actually the four of the five birds on the list are, are small gulls and uh, are quite turn-like, long thin wings, smaller size. And we'll go through each one of them. The top left is, is black-legged kittiwake. And that was the um, rarest of the four. And I take it back, it's not the rarest before. Um, 
It's quite rare in Colorado. The little gull is rarer. Uh, Black Lake Kittiwake is a seafaring gull that nests on coastal cliffs across the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, globally, it is the most numerous of all the gull species, but a tiny percentage trickle across the interior of, interior of the continent during fall migration. Only a few are seen in Larimer County each decade, uh, mainly juveniles, which are distinguished uh, from the adults or from other birds by their strong black pattern of an M shape, uh, shaped in the letter of the shaped in the, in the form of a letter M on the wings, and also a very heavy black nuchal collar. So you can see the. The, uh, the the black line is kind of like a, a a boomerang on one wing, but when when you consider it, you take both wings together, it looks like an M. Okay, uh, the little gull below the black lake kittiwake, and this, uh, let me mention that this black lake kittiwake was a, a nice Christmas present for many birders in northern Colorado. It was found on December twenty fifth, two thousand. Was it 18 or uh, yeah, 2018? Okay, the little gull has only been seen once in, or it's only been, um, there's only one accepted record for little gull in eBird in Larimer County. But there have been other reports that just haven't been documented yet. Uh, and they're much more common in Weld County. So this is a species that could occur more frequently in Larimer if people are looking for it. Uh, they nest near Hudson Bay in Canada, and a few may wander. They, they normally winter around the Great Lakes, and it's probably this population that overshoots the Great Lakes and wanders to Colorado oh, every year almost during fall migration. They turn up at large reservoirs. I've seen little gulls over the years at Pruitt Reservoir, Chatfield Reservoir, Pueblo Reservoir, and I've seen one in Larimer at Horseshoe Lake. And others have been reported at Lake Loveland and Horse Tooth Reservoir. Uh, so juveniles have a similar black M pattern on the wing, like Kitty Wake, and also like Bonaparte Skull, but they also have a, a unique black cap. And you can see the black cap on this bird, black cap on this bird, which I photographed this bird on September 3rd, 2016 at Chatfield Reservoir. Uh, Okay, um, Sabine's gull is the next one on the list. And that's the lower right-hand corner here. So most Sabine's gulls that migrate through Colorado are juveniles, which are, is, is shown here in the upper right of the photograph in flight. But I, I've also seen uh, second year birds like this one here. This one was photographed 16 October, 2016 at Boyd Lake. And it's remarkable how similar this looks to Franklin's gull. And it usually hangs out with Franklin's gull too. Slightly smaller. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, now the Bonaparte skull. Uh, so Bonaparte skull, by the way, is the only gull that normally nests in trees in the boreal forests of region of Canada. But hundreds migrate through Larimer County every fall. They're more common. And juveniles have a black M pattern on the wings, but not as bold as little gull or black the kitty wake. And because they've got a thin black line along the trailing edge, the M looks like it's underlined in black. I should have shown you a picture of that, but I didn't put one in this presentation. Sorry about that. Okay, next, please. Okay, the last gull on that list was the short-filled gull, which is the new name for mew gull. The name just got changed this past year by the AOS. Uh, <clears throat> this gull is very similar to ring-billed gull, our abundant year-round resident gull in Larimer County. As a result, short-filled gulls may be overlooked. It is considered a rare gull in Colorado. Uh, 
Short build gulls lack the ring on the bill and is overall slightly smaller than ring billed gull and slightly, slightly darker mantles. Juveniles, like the one shown here in the lower left, is more uniformly brown than juvenile ring billed gull. So uh, it's also, so this, uh, this juvenile mew gull or short billed gull looks a lot like, in my mind, a juvenile herring gull, all brown. Brown below and above, um, but it's much, much smaller. Okay, so uh, now you'll notice that some of these gulls, the day I put the dates on the on the pictures here. So the top top photo, the short billed gulls on the left and the ring billed gulls on the right, and see how much smaller the bill is and lacks the lacks the black ring around the bill. This picture was taken August fifth. And this short billed gull is still in breeding plumage. But in winter plumage, they develop a lot more brown markings on the head. And the, the bird at the lower right, which is photographed November 4th at Lake Loveland, 2017, has much more darker black, uh, brown, gray brown, smudgy markings on the head and neck, which helps distinguish it from ring billed gull, which is not that darkly marked. Um, but the, some of these other birds are in between. They're start they're molting, so the head's not as dark. Um, but you can always see the other two pictures above and, and in the middle. The bill is really tiny. The head looks round, and the eye looks bigger on the head on the mew gull or short billed gull compared to the ring billed gull. And it's really obvious in those two pictures the difference in the size of the eye compared to the head. Okay, next, please. So the status of short-billed gull in Colorado is changing. <clears throat> Prior to the turn of the century, the 21st century, there were no accepted records in Larimer County. Uh, now there are numerous sightings every year, mostly in the late fall. However, in the last five years, I've been noticing them in early fall as well, starting in early August which is when a large influx of ring-billed gulls arrive from their nesting grounds further north. We don't know exactly where these gulls come from. Uh, they nest across a huge region of Western Canada and further west into Alaska, wintering mainly along the Pacific coast of North America. I'm guessing that the early arriving short-billed gulls are nesting in Southwestern Canada and follow migrating ring-billed ring -billed gulls to Colorado. Next, please. Okay, next I'm gonna talk about the Jaegers. Uh, Jaegers are the falcons of the oceans. They fly like falcons, they come in really fast and, and uh, uh, chase other birds. Although normally they don't kill other birds, occasionally they do, but normally they're just trying to steal the other bird's food. There are three species of Jaeger that occasionally appear in Colorado and always during fall migration. As you can see from this uh, eBird bar chart for Larimer County, reports of Jaegers are quite rare. Okay, so this, uh, next please. So this picture shows the comparison of all three Jaeger species with photographs. And uh, the adults are in the top row, immatures are in the bottom row. So we'll start with the long-tailed Jaeger, top left. Uh, this is the earliest occurring species uh, and also the most common of the three. It passes through from late August to early October. It is the smallest of the three species and shows much less white in the wing compared to the other Jaegers and skuas. The adult long-tailed Jaeger, like this one from Boyd Lake, and this is from 15 September 2014. Uh, <clears throat> um, so adults show no white under the wing at all, and that's unique to long-tailed Jaeger. The other two, two adults, two species, the adults do show a white flash under the wing. On the upper side of the wing, long-tailed Jaegers show very little white, very little white, limited to two or three of the outer primary feathers. Uh, parasitic Jaeger, 
occurs slightly later in the fall, from September to early November, and is intermediate in size between the between long-tailed and Palmer Jaeger. Unlike long-tailed Jaeger, it shows extensive white in the primaries, regardless of age, on both the underside and upper side of the outer primaries. Palmer and Jaeger on the upper right here. Uh, so I mentioned that parasitic Jaeger adult, th here's this, the adult shown here was photographed at Warren Lake on October 14, 2019. And these birds show up usually where, the, where gulls are because they're, they're usually chasing gulls to steal the food from gulls. Uh, okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, unlike, okay. Palmer and Jaeger is the rarest and latest of the three Jaeger species occurring from October to December. This one was shown, this adult was uh, uh, photographed by Aaron Scheip at Chatfield Reservoir on 18 October, 2016. So the adult Palmer and Jaeger, had, had, not only is it bigger, but it's got rounded central tail feathers. So uh, all three Jaeger adults have uh, longer central tail feathers that extend beyond the rest of the tail. Uh, the adult long tail, the tail is ridiculously long and it's obvious. Uh, the adult parasitic, it, it can be several inches long, um, but it's, those are pointed feathers and that's the key. Because Palmer and Jaeger, those central tail feathers that extend beyond the tail are rounded. Uh, it can be hard to see, but uh, if you look at your photographs, you might, you might be able to see it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Palmer and Jaeger. It, it, it's Palmer and is the largest of the three. It sometimes shows a double white patch on the underside of the outer wing. You can see that in this picture by Paul Hurtado from Chatfield Reservoir on 28 November 2011. You see how there's a, a big white flash on the base of the primaries, and then just above that on the base of the primary coverts. There's another white flash. So there's a double double band on the bottom of the wing. You don't see that as it's not obvious on, on the parasitic Jaeger. But I, I gotta say that Palmer and parasitic Jaegers are very difficult to distinguish. Palmer is bigger, but not by much. Uh, one trick I use uh, to separate parasitic from Palmer and Jaeger is comparing the wing length to the wing length of ring-billed gull, which is a species it's usually chasing. Parasitic Jaeger's wingspan is shorter than ring-billed gull's wingspan, whereas Palmer and Jaeger's wingspan is longer. So next, please. Okay, so here's a photograph by Steve Milanoff, taken October 6, 2018, at Lagerman Reservoir in Boulder County. And so we got ring-billed gull on the left, parasitic eager on the right. I can tell it's a parasitic because the central tail feathers are pointed. They extend beyond the other tail feathers and they're pointed. And if you look at the wing length, uh, you can see it's hard to tell, but it's slightly shorter than the ring-billed gull. So in many cases, you might not see the central tail feathers because juveniles are not fully grown or they might, have be, might, might be molting them or they're just too far away, but you can see the, the length of the wing compared to the length of the wing of the ring-billed gull uh, when they're in the same position. So uh, hopefully you can see that this ring-billed gull's wing is longer than this parasitic eager's wing. And in the Atlantic Ocean, when you see a parasitic eager, it's usually chasing a tern and not a gull. That's because it's just too small to chase herring gulls, which are common in the Atlantic Ocean. But it will chase common terns. And here in Colorado, they chase ring billed gulls. Okay, so next, please. Okay, so is this, oops, does this wing longer or shorter than the ring billed gull on the right? This photograph was taken October 13, 2016, by Scott Summershoe at Chatfield Reservoir again. And here, I can see that this wing is longer than the ring-billed gull's wing. And you can also barely see the central tail feathers, which you can't make out in this picture, but other pictures of this gull clearly show that the central tail feathers were rounded. 
So this is an adult Palmer and Jaeger chasing a ring build gull, and you can see the wing length longer than the ring build gull. So that's my identification tip for you guys, for Jaeger, Jaeger lovers. Okay, next please. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about shorebirds. There are several species, almost all of the shorebird species occur predominantly during fall migration compared to spring migration, especially uh, at large reservoirs with exposed mud flats. Timnath Reservoir and Foster Creek Reservoir have hosted excellent fall shorebirds in recent years. The seabird bar chart shows some obvious examples from Larimer County uh, in terms of fall occurring birds. The American Golden Plover, Red Knot, and buff Sandpiper only occur during fall and are quite rare. Uh, still, sandpiper and pectoral sandpipers occur mainly during fall and are much more common. Okay, next, please. Okay, this, the photo on the top left shows a pair of red knots in basic uh, plumage, which basic means non-breeding plumage. So in breeding plumage, they're sort of orangey colored on the, on the breast, like a dowager. In fall, they're just dull gray, uh, but they're quite beefy birds stocky, about the size of killdeer, but stockier than killdeer, and they've got thick black legs and thick black short bill. Um, I've seen red knot at Fossil Creek Reservoir and also at Timnath Reservoir, but only two in, the, in my 24 years of, of, uh, of birding in, in Northern Colorado, or in Larimer County, I should say. Okay, so the top right is another beefy, stocky bird about the size of a killdeer. So about the same size as not. This is um, pectoral sandpiper. And uh, I've heard some people describe pectoral sandpiper as the least sandpiper on steroids. It, it, the plumage looks like least sandpiper. It's very reddy, reddish brown above. It's got the streaked chest. It's got yellowish legs and a droopy bill. So <clears throat> not dissimilar from a least sandpiper, but much larger. Um, okay, so bottom right, the photo at the bottom right, another bird about the same size as a killdeer. This is a stilt sandpiper and it's a juvenile, which aren't very, uh, the, the plumage is not very, Nothing stands out about their plumage. They have yellowish legs and their bill is slightly decurved and they feed with dowager like motion, sewing machine motion. So it's really their overall shape and size that allow us to identify them in the fall. Okay. So the next photo to in the center of the, photo, of the slide is the buff breasted sandpiper. Uh, this is quite rare. It's only occurred four or five times in Larimer County uh, in recent history. In fact, the first one was, I think, five years ago. Uh, almost always at Timnath Reservoir. I think always actually at Timnath Reservoir. Um, this bird's about killdeer size and it's got uh, longish yellow legs. Uh, Okay, this bird, I photographed this bird a couple weeks ago at Pruitt Reservoir. It behaves like a plover, uh, kind of like a robin. It sort of runs, looks around, runs again, looks around. And it's got that round head like a plover also, and short bill like a plover. Uh, it can actually be confused with Baird Sandpiper, which sometimes has a yellowish breast. Remember it's called yellow-breasted sandpiper? But the legs are longer. And bear sandpiper has black legs, not yellow legs. Okay, the two dowagers on the left, I didn't mention this in the bar chart, but this is another species. Uh, Short-billed dowager and long-billed dowager, they both occur more frequently in the fall. Short-billed dowager is a rare, rare shortbird, um, but it, it's been seen recently at, at um, Timnath Reservoir. And I took this, this, the photo of the, these two juveniles at Pruitt Reservoir. 
And so they can be distinguished from long-billed dowagers by the orange wash on the breast, because juvenile long-billed dowagers are just gray-breasted, and the extensive buff edges on the upper side of the, the upper wings. Uh, buff edges and also buffy internal markings in, in those feathers on the upper wings, which are called the scapular feathers. They cover the wing. So uh, long-billed dowager has black centers of those feathers. And the, the feathers that go over the tail, those are called the tertial feathers. And they also have the buffy internal markings, whereas a juvenile long-billed dowager just has a dull gray feather there. So uh, this is the uh, prairie form of the short-billed dowager. Okay. All right, next, please. All right, I mentioned uh, American Golden Plover. It's quite similar to black belly Plover, and juveniles can be difficult to distinguish. So here's a photograph of a juvenile American Golden Plover that I took at Lone Tree Reservoir in Loveland several Octobers ago. Unfortunately, there's no access at Lone Tree Reservoir anymore, but that year, it was a great year for shorebirds. The, the water was down and there was good shoreline. Uh, now, in the flight shot on the right, is the same bird flying next to a juvenile black belly plover. And you can see the black belly plover is paler overall, not as buffy on the underparts, slightly longer build than the golden plover. And the underside of the wing has a black armpit in the black belly plover, but that's missing in the golden plover. And the black belly plover has a white tail, and the golden plover does not. It's just uniformly brown above. Okay, next. So now we can move away from the large lakes and talk about some land birds. Uh, hummingbird species, several species migrate through northern Colorado headed south, but not headed north. Uh, <clears throat> so they occur in fall migration, but not spring. And these would include ruby-throated hummingbird, which is rare, but regular during the month of September. Calliope hummingbird, which occurs from July to mid-September. And Rufus hummingbird, which, which uh, occurs from late June to late September. Calliope hummingbird and Rufus hummingbird are not uncommon. I mean, they're not rare. They can be uncommon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I included black chinned hummingbird in this list just for comparison. Uh, it has a different yet interesting story unto itself. 20 years ago, black chin hummingbirds were absent from Northern Colorado, and now they are a permanent and common part of our avifauna, having extended its range northward similar to the bush tit. Okay, and uh, Anna's hummingbird is also on this list. It actually occurs both in spring and fall, but it's probably overlooked in the fall. So I, I included it here as well, just for, for consideration. All right, next. Okay, migrating hummingbirds are found wherever there are attractive nectar sources. These sources can be in the mountains or the plains or in people's backyards. They can be from natural wildflowers or artificial nectar feeders. The two common fall migrants are both in the genus Silasphorus. And they're shown here. These are Rufus hummingbird and Clyde hummingbird. So another, um, and the same genus is broad-tailed hummingbird, which is our common local breeder. And they share some common traits with broad-tailed hummingbird. For example, all three females of these species have green spotted throats. The males are obviously different from one another, but females and juveniles can be confusing. Females of all three species have a buffy wash to the flanks, with rufous hummingbird showing more buff color than broad-tailed hummingbird which shows more than Calliope hummingbird. Similarly, the amount of rufous in the tail is most in the rufous hummingbird, intermediate and broad-tailed and absent in Calliope. The length of the tail relative to the wings is shortest in Calliope, intermediate in rufous, and longest in broad-tailed. Note in the photo of the female Calliope in the lower, lower right part of the slide, the wings extend beyond the tail. A female rufous would have a tail that extends slightly beyond the wings. 
And broad-tailed female has a tail that extends well beyond the wings. Next, please. So in this photo, the adult males are across the top and the birds in the bottom are probably adult females or possibly immature females as well. Uh, <clears throat> on the bottom left is the female broad tail, and you can see how much longer the tail extends beyond the wings. Ruby-throated and black chin hummingbirds, which are in the center of this slide, um, are in the genus Archilochus. The females lack the green spotting on the throat and also little to no buff wash on the flanks. The main differences between these two Archilochus species is the bill and so is the, the, the differentiating one from the other is the bill length and curvature. It's straight and short for ruby throated on the left hand side, left lower, lower left. And it's long and slightly decurved for black chinned on the lower right of the center. Um, also, ruby throated female has a bright green forecrown, whereas black chinned female has a dull green or even grayish forecrown. Finally, the Anna's hummingbird is a fairly regular vagrant to northern Colorado in the late fall, usually in October, when other hummingbirds are already, have, have already uh, flown south. And this photograph on the bottom right was taken in Fort Collins in October, uh, years ago, actually. Um, Anna's hummingbird is in the genus Calypti, along with Costa's hummingbirds. Aside from males having an iridescent feathers extending from the throat to the crown in the Calypti hummingbirds, these birds differ from our local Archilochus and Celastrus hummingbirds in the shape of the flight feathers but you need really good photos or a bird in the hand to appreciate those differences. The female shows green spots on the throat and the long tail like a broad tail, but lacks the buff flanks like a black chin. Adult females like the one in the photo show a partial gorge. Next please. Okay, now I'll talk about pastoring birds. Uh, so these are pastorings that migrate primarily through, through Larimer County in fall migration. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, I'm sure you can think of others that are not on this list. Uh, and if you actually, if you think of one a pastoring bird that's uh, more, more frequent in the fall than in the spring, feel free to post it in the chat. Um, the first one on my list is Casson's Kingbird. Most of these breed south and west of Colorado but there's a geographically narrow band of breeding Cassis kingbirds that extends northward from central Colorado as far north as Montana. These birds migrate south long after Western kingbirds have departed. So any yellow-bellied kingbird in Larimer County in late September or early October is likely to be a Cassis kingbird. Next on the list is Cassis vireo, which breeds in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest. The next two birds, Sprague's Pippet and Smith's Longspur, are considered rare vagrants in Northern Colorado, but I think they are overlooked. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. They would be mainly heard calling overhead in September and October. And therefore, they're very difficult to document, which would be necessary to be included in eBird's data outputs. The last bird on this list is the Townsend's warbler, which also breeds in the Pacific Northwest and is one of the most common warblers migrating south through Larimer County in fall migration but it's quite rare in spring migration. So there's a huge difference between fall and spring for Townsend's warbler. Next, please. Okay, so here's some, photogra uh, some photographs of these birds. The Casson's kingbird in the upper left here uh, <clears throat> has a yellow belly like Western kingbird, but its tail is dark gray, not black, and it doesn't have the white, white outer tail feathers the Western kingbird has. And it's tipped gray, pale gray. So it's got a pale gray terminal band, kind of like the, the Eastern Kingbird has a bright white terminal band. Uh, its head and breast are darker gray than Western Kingbird. And the dark gray contrasts with the bright white mallard stripe. Okay, going on to Cassin's Vireo in the top center. 
And these can be difficult to distinguish from the blue-headed vireo, which is shown here in the top right. But, and blue-headed is an Eastern USA species. They can wander to Colorado during both spring and fall. Uh, <coughs> Cassin's vireo breeds in the Pacific Northwest. So the, the blue-headed has brighter colors and its gray hood contrasts more sharply with the white throat uh, compared to Cassin's vireo. These very similar species were once lumped with our local Columbia's vireo, and they were all called solitary vireo. So that explains why they're so similar. The Townsend's warbler in the bottom right is usually easy to identify because it's such bright colors and unique pattern. However, however there's one similar species to the female, which uh, is the female Blackburnian warbler. Uh, they can be very similar, except the Blackburnian warbler has an extra stripe down the center of the crown. Okay, now I've shown here the sonogram in the bottom center of Sprague's pipit. Again, this is a bird that's probably overlooked in Fort Collins area or in all of Larimer County uh, <clears throat> because it's just usually flying over, calling, and not too many people identify birds from their call notes. Uh, but the call note of of the Sprague's pipit is unique. It's, it's described as squeet. And it, sometimes it says squeet, sometimes it's squeet, squeet. Uh, this one was, um, this sonogram was produced by David Dowell. And by the way, I might mention that all this, I'm gonna show you some other sonograms and all the photos that I've been using from other people. Uh, I've borrowed from eBird. I've credited them, but uh, the ones without credits are photos that I've taken, but the ones credits other people I've taken from eBird. Okay, the sonograms here, I already said that. Okay, the easiest way to produce a sonogram for documentation is using the Merlin Bird ID app, which is free from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Next, please. Next, please. John. John. Next slide, please. Can you guys hear me? John? John, are you there? I'm waiting for John to show the next slide. All right. Oh, good. I'm glad you could hear. I wonder if John Chanot can hear. Looks like he dropped off. I wonder if he lost the connection. Hmm. Well, let's wait for him to come back on. Yeah. And uh, this is, there's only a couple more slides. Did anybody? Come up with another pastoring bird that occurs more frequently in the fall than the spring? And one group of birds I didn't talk about are, are the sparrows. Lots of sparrow species occur more frequently in the fall. Wilson's warbler, that's an excellent one from Doug Schwartz. So for example, swamp sparrow, white-throated sparrow. Okay. Hopefully John will come back up. And once we see the slides, we'll know he's back up. Now it's possible that I could show the slides from my end. Let me try that. Hold on a moment, folks. Hmm.
We're having technical difficulties. Okay. Should be able to get this up in just a minute here. Okay, Nick, we are back in business. My oh, good. apologies for that. And I miss you. I'll resume your presentation. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost our internet connection here, so you can proceed. Okay, so I just need the slides up again. I see, that would help. Apologies, everybody. We lost our internet connection and then we got it back as quickly as I could. There you go, slideshow. Yep. Okay, thanks for your patience, Nick. My pleasure. Okay, here we go. So I was talking about um, uh, you can you can an easy way to make sonograms like this one is using the Merlin Bird ID app from Cornell University. All right. So next next slide, please. Okay, so now I want to talk about, I mentioned Smith Longspur. So here's, now you need to, uh, in order to identify Smith Longspurs in Larimer County, I think you need to know their flight call. Because most, that's mostly the way they're observed. You rarely get to see one. Uh, but their flight calls are unique. And I've shown all the Longspur flight calls here because all the Longspurs actually occur during fall migration. And even snow bunting can occur during fall migration and snow bunting sounds like a long spur. So the top, the upper left one is thick-billed long spur, which is the new name for McCown's long spur. And then below that is Lapland long spur. And they both have three or four no calls, very similar, but their sonograms are different. So another reason to make sonograms is to, is to be able to identify birds that sound similar, but have different sonograms, different patterns. Uh, the snow bunting is similar also, but looks slightly different on the sonogram. It's off to the right. The chestnut colored long spur on the upper right has a totally different form of, instead of a dry rattle, it's what I call a liquid rattle. And it looks totally different on the sonogram. Sounds different to me too. Now the bottom left is the Smith's long spur. It's a dry rattle, but it's, it's very staccato and uh, it's longer. It's got uh, something like 10 notes in it. And it's kind of similar to the rattle call of the female brown-headed cowbird, which is shown on the right. Some of you may be familiar with that call. So I've heard this uh, rattle a couple of times in Larimer, and it's very, um, very unique. Um, but, and of course, eBird, in order to accept it, has to, has, because it's rare, uh, requires documentation. So if you can make a, a, um, a sonogram, that would be ideal. Okay. Um, so I believe this Smith Longspurs migrate regularly over the front range of Colorado, but uh, are, are not described as such, in other words, commonly. They're not described as being common or, or uncommon because very few observers are able to recognize and document it. Okay, next please. Okay, so now I'll just review my, some conclusions. Uh, we've got the first one. Fall migration provides many bird identification challenges in northern Colorado. Second one, numerous rare and uncommon species can be observed primarily during fall migration, mostly non-passerines. Third one, birding is more popular in the spring. Nonetheless, autumn is a great time to go, get outdoors to observe birds. Fourth, Conclusion, large reservoirs in Larimer County attract a great diversity of fall migrants. 
fifth conclusion, eBird is a great source of data for understanding local bird distribution. And lastly, all birders should submit, all birders should submit sightings to eBird. Be prepared to document rare observations with photographs and or sonograms in order to recognize changing patterns. For example, the short-billed gull early migration that, that I was able to document with photographs over several years. And maybe the, uh, the migration of Smith Longspurs over, over Larimer County, which is much further west than they're thought to migrate. They're believed to be migrating over Kansas and Missouri. So get out there and document those birds. Okay, next slide, please. And with that, I can take some questions or, or host some discussion. I might mention that I'm going to be leading one of those upcoming field trips for Fort Collins Audubon during fall migration on October 24th. Uh, we're going to be visiting uh, Larimer, large lakes in Larimer County. And so uh, I, hope a bunch of, I hope 10 of you <laughs> sign up for that trip. Okay. Oh, thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, yes, greatly appreciated. Um, I'm sure people want to ask questions. We have a small enough group that what I'm going to do is invite people who are using Zoom to unmute their own line and ask a question. And if it gets unmanageable because there's too many people talking at once, then we'll use the chat window. Um, but let's try letting people actually speak up. Um, here in the room, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and I'll, I'll get to you during gaps in the other questions. So the floor is open for questions for Nick. Okay, I'm going to jump in then. Um, not with a question, but with a reminder, Nick. I said at the start of the meeting that we had expanded our boundaries um, to include Windsor. And another place that you've seen a little gull that you didn't mention is uh, Windsor Lake, because um, I was there with you. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, I did mention that they're much more common, much more, there are many more occurrences in uh, Weld County. I've seen them at Union Reservoir. I once saw three together at Union Reservoir, uh, Windsor Lake, and yeah. There, there's probably more coming through Larimer. All right, uh, Joseph, you, if you just, I'll repeat your question so others can hear it. Nick, the, the question from the room here is for, for people who are just starting to learn how to identify birds by sound, um, what advice, uh, what tools, what recommendations do you have for them to improve those skills? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I advise you to make recordings and then you can review your recordings and uh, compare them to other you know, recordings of known species. And then you'll have, a, you'll have a record of it too. So I think you'll, it's a great way to learn because when you hear something that you don't, ident that you don't recognize, um, you know, you're much more motivated to try to look up what it might be. And, and if you have a recording, you can, you can compare, you know, compare the sonogram and compare what it sounds like. And just doing that comparison, do, do, looking up other calls, you'll learn those calls as well. And the Merlin Bird ID app, I think is the way to go. It's Merlin actually identifies the bird for you. And it's correct like 95% of the time. Even if there's multiple birds in the, uh, in, in the, in the, in the, um, in the recording, if there's multiple, bird, multiple birds singing at the same time, Merlin has the capacity to recognize all those birds. So yeah, it's, it's, and it's free. Highly recommend it. Yeah, the, the sound ID feature is new um, to Merlin. And you'll it, it'll do some crazy wrong identification still. 
but it's it's artificial intelligence. It's just going to get better and better and better and better, and um, it will hear things that you overlook. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, I don't consider it birding if you're just holding up a phone and then write down what what the phone heard. But what it will do, Joseph, is, is, is help you build those skills for identification. Because right as the bird's singing, it'll put up lazily bunting. Uh, I think Jim Nature had a question for Nick. Jim, did was your hand raised? You want to unmute yourself? Oh, okay. Oh, maybe it wasn't Jim Nature. It's a different Jim. I'm sorry. Yeah, Jim. different Jim Demartini. Uh, Nick, this uh, picture that you have up now is pretty interesting, and I'd like you to comment about it. Uh, so we have here uh, quite a large number of uh, gulls sitting in a dry uh, reservoir bed, and um, I can't identify all of them, but I'd like you to make a few comments about how often you see gulls uh, like this, how many species there are, when was it, where was it, etc. Comment. For one thing, this is not a reservoir. This is actually the Larimer County landfill. This is the top of the landfill above the area where they're dumping the trash. This picture was taken in July of this year and uh, a remarkable number of gulls for that time. It's, gulls love it here in Round Four Collins and Loveland. And as soon as they're done nesting, they come back in the middle of July, even juveniles from far away, and start, you know, hanging out around their, their usual hangouts. There are three species of gull in this photograph. Uh, there, there are, the, the common one is ring-billed gull, but there's also a small one right in the, just to the right-hand side of it, uh, sort of in the right, right front, right behind the closest gull, that's a Franklin's gull still in breeding plumage. And then there's several California gulls. I think the one on the left in the front is a California gull. The California gulls are larger than ring-billed and darker mantled. Yeah. What's that dark one uh, toward the right center? Okay, that would be uh, a juvenile California gull. They can be very dark brown like that. Not always, but sometimes. Thank you. California gulls nest in Colorado, so it's not unusual to see juveniles. Uh, they, they nest probably 100 miles from Fort Collins in both directions, east and west. At uh, Riverside Reservoir and at, at um, Walden Reservoir. This year, ring-billed gulls nested for the first time in Colorado since 1898. Uh, there's a colony of ring-billed gulls with the California gulls at Jackson Lake. So there are quite a few juvenile ring-billed gulls in the in the uh, Fort Collins area right now. I did not know that. All right, uh, other questions for Nick? Um, you can unmute yourself, you can raise your hand, you can type into the chat window or if there's any in the room here. Um, Nick, uh, I'll, I'll ask a question. You, I think you noted that, um, with Jaegers, one of the, uh, that the, they're usually trying to steal food from gulls. So I would assume that if you wanna look for Jaegers, you wanna find where the gulls are. Um, yes. Are there any other tricks like that with birds that um, flock together? <laughs> or that um, when, when you see bird X, you start looking for bird Y. And I think maybe shorebirds are one good example of that. I think a good example of that is, is Lapland longspur and a flock of horn larks. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe snow bunting and a flock of horn larks. With the, um, the horn larks being very common here in uh, late fall and the others being a rare treat. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples off the top of my head. Uh, well, 
in the fall, you've got, you, you've got these mixed flocks of passerines migrating through, especially like at Rocky Mountain National Park in the pine forests. Uh, you'll find um, chickadees and, and warblers and sparrows all together. And that's usually when I when, I, when I'll uh, I'll notice something like a castings vireo. They're usually with uh, other flocks of migrants, with flocks of other migrants. Right, right. That's another good tip. Okay. Well, I am not seeing any more questions here. I think everybody's just trying to digest all of that information. It was fantastic, and I got to say, it's great that you didn't have like every picture of a shorebird that was crystal clear because you never see them that way in the field. And it's actually better for learning to get a realistic look at one in a photo. Um, I wanted to uh, let people know uh, about next month's program before we sign off here. Um, and I need to stop sharing my screen to do that. Oh, goodness. Here we go. And believe me, I've learned some lessons today, and I will be uh, improving on this next month. Um, so next month, we'll be meeting again the second Thursday. Um, that's October 14th. And our speaker will be Kelsey Holloway from Bird Conservancy, the Rockies. The title of the presentation is, it's about damn time. Beavers are valuable ecosystem engineers. So we're gonna have a great talk next month about beavers and about Kelsey's studies of them on the South Platte River. Um, that's October 14th. We hope you can join us again next month. And I'm sure everybody joins me in, in thanking Nick for his uh, presentation. I thank you for bearing with me through the technical challenges and promise to do better next month. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I hope we see you again next month. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you.